it's um, even in the Western Indian Ocean, uh, wild region, and, and in Wyoming, I've seen that they've even started giving grants and um, yeah, grants for people who are working in cities, issues to do with cities, sustainable cities. There is now a lot of interest in the cities. And you're wondering, so what? So what's in the city? How does a city have to do? What does a city have to do with the environment and that kind of thing? And the answer is a lot, a lot, a lot. So probably we need to know how, how did cities begin? How are they found the, the place where they are today? So a bit of this background is on, on Amer an American setting, but I'm sure we can relate it to many other many other cities in, in, in the world, and even our own cities in Kenya. Uh, so far, we have three cities, Nairobi, Kisumu, and, um, and, uh, and Mombasa. But I think Nakuru is just in the office. So yeah, it's, it is very interesting when you read some of things to measure them against our very own and see where are we uh, are we suffering the same problem? Is, is, is problem that we are going through only very unique to Kenya? Or is it a problem of the cities? Just like one would say, a curse of cities and that kind of thing. So, uh, so today, uh, the topic is evolution of land use planning. And uh, what I say that we are going to have a uh, look at cities. And uh, so, it, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Sawa, sawa. So, let us uh, do a small recap on land use conflicts, which we did at the beginning of this, uh, when, when we started learning this uh, unit, we, we talked about land use conflict. And we said that land, land is good. It's, it's on land, all our activities are actually based on land. You remove land and man is left nowhere. So all our activities actually have a basis directly or indirectly on land. And uh, now this land, uh, unfortunately, it can be, okay, fortunately, it can be put into so, so many uses. The kinds of uses you can put land into, it's almost, um, you, you, there's so much, you can't even count. Okay, now, but there's a problem. Uh, because the land is so versatile, because you can put it, split, and, and I think we went through that we even, try to, to look at, I don't remember whether it was in a group work, we tried to, to see what are some of the, uh, the, the current conflicts between land use. Okay, and, and we looked, uh, looked at um, what, what, what it were you, probably you, you have land, which is very good for farming, but it's also very good for industry. Maybe the location is, is fantastic. Uh, the source of water is, is very good, you know, all those kind of things. And that same land is also very good for agriculture. Oh, that same land is very good for settlement. Okay. So uh, if you look at land from that point of view, you can already see a conflict even before you, before you do anything else. Just the very, the very thought that this land can be put into so many uses. Why? because so many people would like to put it into all those many uses, and yet it is one land. Again, this land is also finite. Okay, you can say, okay, fine, because we've taken that portion and also increased, no. The land is finite. It is... I think that you, you want to farm, but uh, best titanium says, okay, we have some mineral deposits under this land, we should, uh, we should exploit it. Yeah, the environment so this also comes, no, once you start opening the, 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 the soil, 
this and this will happen, we are going to lose biodiversity, we are going to do this, you know, all that kind of things. Yeah. So on the one hand, you're holding the stick of conservation or maybe farming. On the other hand, there's the, the stick of industrial development. So those, those conflicts are there. And in some cases, I think the conflicts have won and at times land has just been left there because people can't agree on what needs to be done on that land. So you say, okay, it's a lose-lose situation, let it stay the way it is. Wait a minute. Conservation then wins because you don't do anything on land, very good for, for the biodiversity. But what we are saying is that despite all these conflicts, yeah, these conflicts can be solved. And the way to solve them is by using, using planning. Then planning resolves these conflicts. So that is what you're learning in this unit. Whatever we are doing, whatever we are learning is all geared towards planning. Planning on the use of land, prioritizing. And you already went through the, 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 the process what you need to do, you need to look at alternatives, you need to go to get your, your, your background data, very, 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 very important, your inventory, your land suitability has to come out very strongly. We looked at land evaluation, I think in the last, uh, last week, all those things, just trying to figure out which is the best use that this land can be put into. Not, not, not basing it on just any other thing, but just doing a very, very thorough study. Because you might actually end up seeing, and this land can, can be put, sustainably be put into maybe farming or even industry or even something else. And sustainably means that uh, you've taken care of the environment, you've taken care of the people, and whatever use you're going to put it into, you'd also be able to generate some income. It's going to be um, economically sustainable. So uh, this, is, this, this is what we are saying that um, when you go through the planning process, you might be able now to come up with probably even one. Then when you do that, then from there, you can further now be able to prioritize, uh, I think, uh, these three are suitable, but we are going to prioritize this based on this and this. Number one, they're not just going to be political decisions. They're not just going to be mental decisions. They're not going to be tribal decisions. They are decisions that are going to be based on, on, on science and good research, good data gathering, looking at people, environment, and of course, the, the viability economy of the project. And this is what makes uh, land use planning very important. So what happens? Whenever you do not have any planning, you are in for trouble. And, and I think in Kenya, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen, and, and we are still going to continue seeing that, that there's a lot, there's a lot of conflict, land use conflict, uh, for going up in Namsa at times and, and it, it turns into, into a where at times you've seen demolitions, demolitions maybe of, of capital investments, investments that have been put up using a lot of money. And you're like, why, why is the country doing this? You see, the reason is probably there was a planning, there was a plan for that particular piece of land. Or the plan remained on paper. It was never implemented. Remember what you talked about land is planning. It is going ahead and implementing the plan. So if you're not implementing your plan, and I'll give you a perfect example, Siokimau, I don't know. Let me, let me, let me find out how many of you uh -huh. Did, did anybody hear anything about Siokimau? Okay, as usual, you refuse to talk, so I go looking for you. So just wait a minute. Um, if nobody volunteers, I will volunteer you. What happened? Because that was a perfect, a, 
perfect land use conflict. Mwandikwa. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, hey, so have you ever heard of Siokimau? How do you go primary? Primary. Siokimau <laughs> siya kitambo. Who has heard of, of that conflict in Siokimau? Yeah. Um, what I know about Sokimao is that the recent, uh, it's, it's, it's recent though, people had built uh, houses over there and then the government came and uh, said uh, it wants put up a road. Uh, uh -huh. that's the thing. Yeah. Was so, it a road? Yeah, if I, if I, if I recall oh, right. Yeah. But there was a conflict, the what government said those those settlements were illegal. Where are they illegal? Why do you think they are illegal? To stop sharing, I want to to show you something because uh, I think this is important. Just a minute. Just listen to the Now, several families in the Sokimawa State are spending the night in the cold after their houses were demolished. The affected residents claim that the person who sold the land to them had not paid the original owner's dues, hence the standoff by the swallow Can you see? Madam, kindly mute your mic. Uh, if I mute my mic, you're not hearing. I, it's not mine, actually. Oh, you want me to mute? Okay, fine. Let me, let me try and see that. Just, just minutes minute after, after 7 a.m. Yes, if I mute my mic, uh, okay, I'll not be able to explain. So. Residents of Siokimau area woke up to this. Bulldozers parked outside what was once a serene neighborhood, what these residents once called home, now reduced to debris. According to residents, an eviction order had been issued on the 31st of January through the area district officer. The notice warning of a demolition that would bring down all 32 houses built on this five acre piece of land. Katika five acre, order kama ilitolewa kotini ya kukota kwa hivyo hapa kuna unyanyasaji ambao umeendelea kwa sababu hizi nyumba zingine zimebaki ambazo ziko kwa the same plant the Siokimau area has been an area met by cases of same script, different caste, whereby there have been numerous of cases reported on land issues but as for now about 15 households have been rendered homeless and in 2000 and subsequently subdivided and sold to the current residents. However, the deal is said to have gone sour, prompting the courts to intervene. An eviction notice followed. Mimi nimenunua hii plot yangu through hardship. Nimekuwa nikifanya kazi, kazi ambazo sio za maana. Ndio nipate pesa ya kununua hiyo plot. Mzee wangu amechukua loan kwa the incident rekindled memories of a similar incident in 2004 when residents of Siokimau suffered forceful demolitions. Said Aswale KTN. Every filmmaker starts as a fan. Okay. So you have an idea what Siokimau was about? Yes. Yeah. Now, Siokima, sorry, Siokimau was. Um, oh, Siokimau is still Kenya. So, <laughs> Siokimau, the demolition. The reason why those buildings were demolished, those homes were demolished, is because the land sits on KAA land. Okay, those, those, the, the land 
actually belongs to KA, the Kenya Airport Authority. It had been um, and actually that land KA came to but what had happened because it had laid idle for so long and as usual Kenyans went ahead through dubious means I don't know where they got the title actually government land and you can see that the demolitions were ruthless. They were ruthless. And, and the government did not want to know. Oh, you see that, like, that lady saying, oh, we want her to put up this. The government didn't want to know. OK, so that's a very, very clear case of land use conflict. Land, so it's very good for, for the airport, near the airport and everything. But also the people say, oh, this is a beautiful place to set a very nice a flat land. And that kind of thing. So, uh, and this can begin the city and that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so finally, the, 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 the houses had to go. People cried, people cried for days, but that, that was it. That was it. So, this, there are several typical cases of land use conflict. Even those people that go ahead and build on, um, on road reserve. Yeah, road reserve, and we even say, Mimi, Mia was sold this land. Uh, have a title very well. Did you check whether that? If it's not being put into use, has it? Does it have a demarcation? Yes. What is it? A road reserve? Then please keep away from it. It doesn't matter whether the president sold it to you or whoever, because when push comes to shove then you can be sure you'll be left. A number of those typical examples of land use conflict. And many times it's the government versus the people. In, in many cases, of course, we also have cases where people have grabbed land for uh, school land. People have grabbed land that has been set aside for certain community projects. And, and we see how it all ends up. It's not very nice. It's most of the cases, it turns very, very ugly. What am I going to look at today? So that was just an introduction. It was a recap of what we've been um, doing uh, in the last few weeks. And uh, so today I want to look for need for planning. Is there a need for planning, which uh, I've already talked about, this need for planning because of the conflicts. If we don't plan for land, then let's ready ourselves for conflict because they will come. They will come big and strong and destructive. Then uh, I want us today also to look at the historical forces. What, what has led the cities, and I said we have a special focus on cities. What has led the cities to be where they are today and what they are today? What, what has contributed to that? Okay, so we're going to look at historical forces and we're going to especially focus on the US. <laughs> How did their cities develop? Then we are also going to look at the rural urban shift. And uh, how has this contributed even to land use? Then you're going to look at my favorite, the urban sprawl. We're going to spend some time on this. <laughs> Probably you're wondering what is the one, uh, the, the urban sprawl you're going to find out very soon. And then we are going to look with, uh, to look at the problems with unplanned growth. When there is growth, and there is a lot of growth that's happened, not just in Kenya, but all over the world. When growth happens, growth is very good. But when it is unplanned, it can be a pain. Okay, so you're going to look at that. Then these planning principles, but really, really, I'm not going to that on I missed it. And then we're going to look at urban planning issues. What are the issues? And how can we deal with these issues? So that makes up uh, uh, our, 
our lecture for today. So let's look at the background. And I say most of these uh, are basic. So right now, as it were, I'm saying, I'm has been altered by human beings. We have changed things. Okay. And uh, the undernote to that is saying most of this change or most of these alterations that we have uh, done, we have hardly thought about the consequences. Okay, so put that in mind. You do something, you see an opportunity. To realize we did not think about the consequences of what we are doing. Okay, so hold on to that thought as we continue. Now, most land use decisions, even to date, are still based primarily on economic considerations. Either how, how much money can I make, or how much money can I save, yeah, or short term needs rather than on unique analysis of they are not even very expensive. Uh, you, you are ready to, to take a loan, to borrow, so that at least you can, you can buy this board because even your neighbor board we have even started building the place is very nice uh, please join us there and, and that's okay that's okay that is good you see so you all do it whoever joins does it but the question is because you are all users has anybody taken time to think about the consequences of the, what you're doing and, and i'll give you whatever a very good example why why are we still suffering in Nairobi. The, the reason is very simple. Then just there was no planning. There was no planning. So fast, just think I'm going to put up a house. <clears throat> Have you thought, where am I going to get my water from? How are we going to dispose our waste? How are we going to be getting from here to the city? You know, all those things. Most of the times you don't look at them, you just maybe look, oh, the plots are very cheap. So let's go for them and that kind of thing. So we also know that due to these natural ecosystems uh, have been altered. They have been changed, they have been destroyed. And we have uh, forgotten that uh, for each natural ecosystem, there is what we call that natural tipping point beyond, beyond which it cannot be salvaged again. Okay, so whatever use we are putting this land into, because in most cases we go into natural ecosystems and start doing the things that we are doing, whatever they are. So we forget that it's true, we are, we are, we are. We are interacting with nature, maybe we are putting up uh, whatever it is we are putting up, but we forget that that natural ecosystem, once it is destroyed, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to bring it back. So in Kenya, and this is not just in Kenya, but in the whole world over, in the US, and you'd be like, oh, were well, they are colonialists in the US? Yes, they were. When Christopher Columbus discovered the US, he brought his people. Where was Christopher Columbus from? Chanione kama mnasoma historia. Where was Christopher Columbus from? Yusuf Omar. Yusuf Omar, are you in class? Yusuf? Yes, I'm in class. Okay, where was Christopher Columbus from? Usha, you're 
Yes, I think he was Italian. Okay, you think he was Italian? Okay, that is Yusuf's guess. Somebody else who think Christopher Columbus was from? Uh, Yusuf, uh, Yusuf, unataka kusema kitu kingine? Anybody else? Oh, Ian, you've never heard of Christopher Columbus? I've heard the, I know what I know about uh, Christopher Columbus is uh, he was a maritime explorer. So, yeah, he was from Italy. So he explored the Atlantic Oceans. Yeah, that's a little bit of, of history. I know you have him. some knowledge. That's very good. That's very good. He was a marine explorer. But where was he from? See, then Google, Germany, at a quick Google. I'm not checking whether you're copying. So, Odiambo, Odiambo Rimba. Where have you been? Yeah? Odiambo. I'll check my register whether you've been attending. Where was Christopher Columbus from? Yeah, I'm Skia. Duo. Where was he from? Yes, he discovered America. I've already said that. I just want to know where he was from. He was from Italy. He was an, an explorer. Just a minute. Just a sec. Yeah. Uh, he was a uh, he was a mar mar maritime explorer, and when he went to West, of course, he says he discovered Christopher Columbus. Of course, later brought it. Why I was asking about his nationality is because once he discovered the, the US, he went back home and he wanted his people to come and see the US. So they are not the only ones came, who came. We know the British. The British went to the US, the Irish went to the US, and, and of course the Africans went to the US as slaves, <laughs> unfortunately. So, yes, the U.S. was colonized, Kenya was colonized, and quite a number of other countries were colonized, okay? So what you are saying, there was something about these colonialists. You may wonder why am I dwelling on colonialists. It's because when these colonialists came in Kenya and also in other countries like the U.S., they converted landscapes to farming. If we can try and remember our little, the, the history that we know, yeah? This land was converted because that was the first thing that man did once they conquered is just where do we get our food from? So they started farming. And then slowly, slowly, they started small towns. And then from there, the towns became cities. That is what happened in Nairobi. That is what happened in Mombasa. Yeah, look at those cities in Kenya. Even in the world that sprouted early, there was the colonial footprint in them. And there was just that evolution. You start as a farmer, probably the farmers now start getting a center where they can go and sell their goods, maybe a small shopping center within. Someone is bringing eggs, another one is bringing milk, another one is bringing whatever it is they are growing. And then they, maybe they start small cottage industries. And then from there, go expanding. Then you finally get cities and the rest is history. Okay, now, if you remember in SMR 311, this five zones, and I talk, we talked about the line, and we said that most, most of the cities tended to be built or to develop a lot of 
mostly the waterways, the waterways were a big attraction to whoever people who went up to, to develop cities because water, apart from uh, providing the water, the water that was needed for maybe domestic or whatever other uses, water was also very important as a means of transportation, maybe a river, a lake and that kind of thing. Look at Mombasa. I mean, Mombasa developed much earlier than Nairobi. And what attracted the, whatever, the, the waterways, the port facilities, or the, the possibilities of a port where ships from all over could, could dock the hinterland and, and do whatever it was they wanted, get the goods and from there transport them back. So waterways, if, and if you can trace along most cities in the world, you will not, especially one of the attractions. So, of course, uh, the waterways, as I say, they allow people to, from wherever, to develop commerce and trade. And you know, you know how trade developed, like in Africa, even in Kenya, the Arabs would come, <laughs> they would come carrying cowrie shells from, can you imagine, cowrie shells from the coast. And then they'd go and, and tell our chiefs who condani and tell them how precious those things are. And they would change that with whatever other precious things they had, including elephant tusks, which are so valuable. Okay. And, and maybe skins from animals, from wild animals and that kind of thing. And uh, well, when, when that started, we know that the rest is history. Of course, the next thing they demanded was people. And then they didn't be given mirrors, you know, you, so you can you can imagine what silly things these people exchange for valuable things that 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 we had in, in, inside in the hinterland. Uh, as I said already, that uh, early towns were built near water and have transfer points be between water systems, and 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 these the motivation was trade. Now, in some countries like the U.S. They, most of them, and you can imagine when development started in the US. So most of them uh, remained rural. Rural means uh, where people are basically uh, living, uh, agriculture probably is the, is, is the way of don't have Maybe don't have cities, just small towns, and mostly for just local trade, local exchange of, of goods and services. And that kind of thing, no, no, probably no large scale farming, you know. So most of them remained that way until the industrial growth began. And this was in the last third from the 1860s when the industrial revolution began. So, and you can imagine, you can almost know why they, they did need to grow food on a large scale. Why, where, where are you going to sell it? We didn't have cities. So most of the food they grew was just, uh, it would circulate just within, within the village. Okay, I'm growing this, you're growing that, so let's exchange. That's why even butter trade was more, was uh, very rampant at that time. Okay, now with the coming of the industrial revolution, things changed. Things actually, this was the turning point, the industrial revolution. Uh, because what happened, the industries were built, these industries were huge, they needed people, number one, and they needed raw materials. Okay, so mater raw materials can be anything from the farms, from the ground, like coal and iron, and, and living in the rural the industrial revolution took off most of them went into those areas where the industries were situated to look for jobs okay so the men would go there maybe the younger boys would soon fall after to take care of the homes so so you can also imagine what happened so once they went to where the industries were what happened uh they had to be accommodated. So they, there was an issue of residential places for these people. So people are migrating 
from all over now looking all oh, then the world will go around oh if you go to the city you can you get a job you earn money and you'll be able to send it back home to your people and that kind of thing so uh, other people started coming in remember once industry developed you can't stop people from coming in so people even like in the us for them the european immigrants started coming in and these people because they're working in the industrial areas in the, in the towns people congregated in those areas and the city started being subdivided okay and, and, and a community, community started developing in the city. Maybe men who are in the same factory or who are doing the same job, uh, they end up li living in the same uh, tenement houses. They were, th those were the, resi the residential areas. Okay, maybe you, maybe you are work, maybe your boss has rented some, some houses for his workers. And with time, communities developed a culture a culture developed among these people jacinta just a minute jacinta you're coming in 41 minutes after time so just plan to be attending your classes early in time so uh yeah so with time a culture developed among these people then there was a social life that uh, started developing. Then, of course, there are also very many opportunities that are being offered here. Uh, because remember, people are coming from all over. People with different skills, people with different mannerisms, uh, people with different norms and beliefs. They are all coming, they're mixing, they're doing the, the same work and that kind of thing. Now, I think you can already picture it into your mind. Uh, so people kept coming. Uh, the industrial revolution continued to grow, which was very good. And we know that this is where Europe lost most of its forest. This is the time at which Europe started losing its forest because the industrial revolution needed power, it needed energy. Well. This is the time they cleared their forest without thinking twice. Remember what I said, you, 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 you adopt the land use without thinking about the consequences. This, is, this, is, this was the beginning of the end of the European forest, of the American forest. And I'm talking about the natural primary forest. This was the beginning of the end because they, they just went ahead. They cut the trees to, 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 to provide energy. And also, this was the beginning of our trouble with climate change. Yeah. If you look at the, if you look at the Paris Agreement of 20, 2015, where they've set, uh, they've set uh, a standard and they're saying, we want to ensure that the, the temperatures do not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius beyond the pre-industrial temperatures. So we are using the industrial revolution, that industrial period as our benchmark. Before, because before that, the temperatures were okay. But since the Industrial Revolution, I think I showed you this in, in SMR, uh, I forget. <laughs> when you're looking at uh, global warming, I think it's 402, uh, imagine global issues. We looked at global warming and we looked at those temperatures before the industrial time and what happened after the industrial time. So this was, this is the time, the age of pollution, the air pollution. Um, Pollution is that remember these things were not set up. The effluent from the industries was drained. That, that is one of the reasons I forgot to say why they, they, they developed along waterways. It was a place to, 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 to dispel what you don't want, your effluent, your waste, all the way down the river. The river will carry it away. Okay. 
So that is already a pollution. There was the air pollution because of the, all that smoke that was being produced, probably also uh, other kinds of gases are being produced and people are just living nearby. And then these people who are living in these areas, it was, they became so crowded, so crowded. And, and diseases started breaking out, communal diseases, the diseases that are easily communicable. Uh, started also developing. I think if it was during this COVID era, <laughs> we'd have been in trouble. The, I mean, the, if, if COVID broke around those things, I'm not sure. No, but I think the I think the Spanish flu came before that thing. I'm not sure. So, so you can imagine. So there were so many disease outbreak outbreakages. Uh, the, the, it was just dirty all over very, very dirty, and uh, with people spending almost all their time working or making that extra extra coin, it was difficult. No, so uh, when you have many people coming into a place, you know what happens to land. You just know what happens to land. The land prices just shoot up. They just go up and up and up, just because the demand has gone up. And we can say the land, land is very elastic. It's a very elastic good. Elastic means it responds to the laws of supply and demand. Yeah, La we know that we, we've seen that in our country. When the demand for a certain area goes up, the prices, they, they, they are just beyond, beyond many people. Okay. So this is what happened as now the cities continued growing as more and more people went into the cities as the demand for land, even for industries and for other associated, you and an industry come with so many other associated things, the demand for land began to go up. So what happened? People started looking for cheaper areas away from the city. Let me pause a bit. Do you think this has happened in Kenya? And if so, where? Do you think the fact that the land, uh, the, the price of land in Nairobi is so expensive, do you think people have started moving out to areas beyond Nairobi? Anyone? Yes, people are moving to Kikuyu. Okay, people are moving to Kikuyu. Where else? Where else? Viru. Viru. Where else? Kwanza. Muranga. Kiambu. 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 Where else? Areas, areas along Mombasa Road. Areas along Mombasa Road. Where else? Is that very famous places? Uko na uko kielekea umasaini. Come on. Rongai. Yeah, Rongai, Kitengela, all those areas. So people are just looking because they are moving away from the city. The land is unaffordable. Okay. So, and, and we are going to look at that. We are going to look at that today. We're going to look at the pros and the cons for doing what, what it is that we are doing now. And as I said, it's not only our problem, it's the problem the world over. So what happened in the US? By 1950, 60% of the urban population lived in central cities in, within the, the cities. Okay, so that is where they had their houses and everything, 60% of those people. By 1990, which is 40 years later, only 30% of the urban population lived in central cities. Where had the other 60% gone? They had gone away. They had gone to look. It's not that they had just disappeared. No. It's not that they had stopped working in the city. No. But they have, had moved out of the central city just because it was not affordable, but also because of what I'm talking Yeah. Uh, it just made it very, very difficult for many people to desire to, to live there. So on top of that, 
So you brought this crowded city. Just close your eyes and imagine this crowded city. When you're getting out of your house, you're just bumping into your neighbor. Maybe that neighbor you don't like. Or that neighbor who makes so much noise and you wish you could move, but you can't move. You can't afford to move. Uh, the air is never... And that kind of thing. So picture that. And then open your eyes and look at the beautiful place, full of trees, uh, nice weather. I yeah. Know. So we're saying uh, agricultural land, which was in the towns, started becoming very attractive to people. Note the word agricultural land. Does that sound familiar in Kenya? Is that familiar in Kenya? Okay, you are still thinking. I'll give you time to think. So, now, from there, land started being viewed as a commodity, not an unrenewable resource to be managed. What am I saying? Uh, at that point, people started thinking, I should buy this land to build my home. Okay. Without thinking, what is this land used for? Will the current use continue? And that would be it. And if that current use does not continue, what will happen? You see, we, we people didn't have time to think through that. And I think even up to today, people don't think through that. People just want land. You just want land and it's a beautiful place. The area is good, fine. I want that land in Kiambu. I want that land in, in, in Kikuyu. I want that land in all those nice areas. Very well, no problem. But what about that land as an unrenewable resource that needs to be managed well and maximally so that it can give you the best. So if that land is good for farming, for heaven's sake, let it remain under farming. If that land should be left the way it is, just because of maybe conservation of biodiversity, uh, maybe also for just environmental conservation, then we, we leave it that way. We don't introduce another use. So all that was not considered. Um, then we you know for, for the use, especially most single family houses after World War II were built on large lots away from city congestion. So, so people started moving away from the, uh, from the congestion of the city. Levi Frank, how are you? Levi Frank? Is Levi Frank a member of this class? No, it's... No, it's, it's, it's He's not, so why are you joining? Yeah. Have you seen this? It's summer. I think it's summer boys. Uh, ah, it's not summer boys. I, I invited summer boys a few minutes ago. So I've just, because uh, I've never heard, I've never seen that name. Some aboard. Some aboard. Some aboard. I can see you. So I don't think that will be Frank or some aboard. So I've thrown them out wherever they are. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, I want now to talk to you about what happened. What happened? This is what happened. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Yes, you can see your screen. Can you see my cursor? 
Well, the picture that my casa is moving along, what, what is it? What do you think this is? What, what is this? Houses. Anybody? Oh, the houses. What direction are they in? Okay, it looks um, some metrics were used. All those are houses. Are you seeing what has happened now? This is what we call the urban sprawl. The picture I've put uh, alongside there, don't mistake it for anything else. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate the word sprawl, what a sprawl is. A sprawl is like when you're lying down with your legs and feet apart, you're just pointing in all directions. Things are just going around in all directions. And I'm sure you can see that in this. There are some that are going this way. There are some that are going that way. There are some that are going this way. Uh, you might think, oh, they look well planned. They're in good lines. Uh, symmetrical. If it's a circle, this is almost a perfect circle. It's an arc, very, very perfect. Uh, at least they are better than ours. Let us in Huanga all over. These are houses, as we said, and they look so well planned, yeah? All those straight lines and that kind of thing, all those nice curves. Wow, it looks beautiful, yeah? Uh, who would, like, would you like to live there? Would you like to live in such a place? Yes. Yeah, it looks nice. Oh, really? <laughs> no, 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 a big no. For you, it's no. For me, it's a no and a big no. I would not want to oh, why no? Why no? In that crowd, is it, how would I even find my home? You know? Okay, fine. Of course, I'm just making a joke because there are streets and everything. Uh, yeah. Just by yeah. looking at those pictures, you, you may see the lines are straight and everything, but you'll be surprised. Well, it's almost like a Sorry? Say again. So, yeah, it looks like nice. Okay. But there's a name for that. There's a name for that. Originally, I used to say, oh, these houses look there. Like, so well. Even when I go to Europe and look at them, even like right from the ground, say, oh, these, these people are so organized. These things are they really know where to put everything uh until i later came to read about urban school and understanding i was like wow what on earth is this okay uh so let's continue So, so we, we are just talking about now what started happening. After the inner city became, became inhabitable, people started moving out of the city and, and things started developing. And, and also what happened actually, we said one of the reasons why people were moving out of the cities was because of the, because of the, the congestion in the city pollution in the city and also the who not afford if you wanted a family unit uh, it was almost impossible maybe for the middle income earning people just to, to own a piece of land in the city so these people started eyeing the land that was surrounding the city and most of that land cases ended up being agricultural land so what also happened actually around the same time, and, and I want you to open up your minds now and, and think about Kenya. What happened? Convenience and personal automobiles escalated. Decentralized housing patterns and diminished the importance of mass transit. This is going to be our, our activity, but uh, I need to finish up this before I need to finish this fast. So, uh, so we are going to come back to that. Then 
uh, there was also decreased energy efficiency. When now this thing happened, when people started moving out of the city and they started developing as such states as this, remember, even in the, U, in the UK, in the US, these areas, are, this kind of, it's outside the inner city. Okay, so, and, and, and things started happening. Then there was increased cost of supplying utilities, and we are just going to find out why, why, why. Now, so we come to the world. So I started by looking at pro what has in all direction and planned. So let's look at the urban sprawl. What is it? Urban sprawl is a pattern of unplanned low density housing and commercial development outside of cities. Outside of cities. So mark the word unplanned and mark the word out of outside the cities. Uh, it usually takes place on undeveloped land, a prior undeveloped land. Uh, maybe also on wealthy suburbs adjacent to the cities. Maybe track development or construction of similar residential units over large areas. Look at these houses, they just look all alike. Yani, can you imagine if you wanted to build your mansion here? Nobody would allow you. Everybody has to be the same. That's one of the reasons I even hate this kind of house. I'm not dismissing them. No, I'm not, because these are people's homes. I am just saying, given a choice, I wouldn't want to be here. So look at that uniformity. That's why I was asking, how do you tell your house from an area or whatever? You have to have your GPS reading. So, so these houses tended to be the same, similar pattern. Uh, and of course, you are even to even if you have to de de develop it yourself, this is a plan, so you can't go beyond that. Uh, so it's similar units. Most of the times, they were adjacent to the city. Remember, these are not necessarily poor places. No, 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 no. It's just that where they are, the the pattern of growth is unplanned, and also the fact that they are outside the cities and they target undeveloped land, land which is lying idle. Uh, I want us to look at uh, see whether. We... Let me see whether we can watch this video before we have the discussions. Just a sec. So we'll start with the definitions. So, so I want you to listen to this uh, video. It's what you call Wikipedia. Urban sprawl or suburban sprawl describes the expansion of human populations away from central urban areas into low-density, monofunctional and usually car-dependent communities, in a process called suburbanization. In addition to describing a particular form of urbanization, the term also relates to the social and environmental consequences associated with this development. In the is often used to denote similar dynamics and phenomena, although the term urban sprawl is currently being used by the European Environment Agency. There is widespread disagreement about what constitutes sprawl and how to quantify it. For example, some commentators measure sprawl only with the average number of residential units 
Bulgaria. But others associate it with decentralization, spread of population without a well-defined center, discontinuity, leapfrog development, as defined below, segregation of uses, and so forth. The term urban sprawl is highly politicized, and almost always has negative connotations. It is criticized for causing environmental degradation, and intensifying Due to the pejorative meaning of the term, few openly support urban sprawl as such. The term has become a rallying cry for managing urban growth. statesduka.com where you can shop in the US we're helping you shop on websites like Walmart, Best, Best Buy, Buy Amazon, Amazon, Urban, Urban Sprawl. Sprawl. We've, all We've all seen, seen it. it. Strip, strip malls, malls residential, residential subdivisions, subdivisions clogged streets. streets. But which, but which US, US metro area sprawls the most? Is it Los Angeles, a city built around the car? Or is it another Sunbelt city like Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Antonio, or Atlanta? Unfortunately, answering this simple question is actually really hard. Before you can say which city sprawls the most, first you have to define what sprawl is and how best to measure it. So let's start there at defining sprawl. The most tempting way to define sprawl is by describing it. You know, listing the things that make sprawl sprawl. Cul-de-sacs are often considered sprawl indicators because they create street patterns that favor cars over pedestrians. A strip mall, shopping malls, or any business that separates themselves from the street with a parking lot are considered sprawl too. How do the experts define sprawl? Urban most definitions include language about low density, single purpose, residential or commercial construction, and locations distant from existing public services and infrastructure. Other scholars have called sprawl unsustainable, uncoordinated, inefficient, and auto-dependent. As there is no one definition of sprawl, researchers create their own definitions or rely on those created by others. I think the best definition is both clear and measurable. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to define sprawl as low density, meaning areas without tall buildings and lots of space between buildings, single purpose, meaning zoning separates commercial, residential, and industrial uses to an extreme degree, and auto-dependent, sprawling areas are terrible places to get around on bike or on foot. Okay, now that we have a workable definition, we can begin to measure cities and figure out which one sprawls the most. But how? We need to come up with several different metrics because our definition consists of several different dimensions. To measure the residential density of an area, the most common measure is simply persons per square mile or some other unit of area. You can calculate this metric for small areas of a city, such as census tracts or blocks, and get a map that shows the difference in density between the city center and the suburbs. You can also determine density by measuring a 12,500 persons per square mile. That's the density that's generally transit supportive and urban feeling. Urban sprawl tends to have very separate land uses, so we need to measure the degree to which a city has a mix of uses or not. As with all of these dimensions, there are lots of ways to measure this. You can measure the percentage of residents that live with a business within blocks of their homes, or measure the percentage of residents with a shopping center within one mile of their homes. You could do the same sort of thing with schools or other institutions as well. The idea here is that the areas of urban sprawl will have lots of people that do not have good shopping options within walking distance of their homes. How do we measure how auto-dependent a city is? Again, there are several ways to do this, but researchers often measure the road network. It's generally believed that sprawling areas designed around the car have much larger blocks with fewer intersections. Dense, walkable areas have a finer grained street network. Using publicly available street network data and geographic information system software, researchers can calculate the average block size and intersections per mile to get a sense for how much of a city has an auto-oriented street network. At this point, it should be obvious that it's pretty much impossible to identify one single city that sprawls the most in the United States. 
For one thing, researchers can't even agree on a definition for sprawl, and secondly, there are dozens of different metrics for measuring sprawl, and the ones chosen will have an impact on the overall treat network. At this point, it should be obvious that it's pretty much impossible to identify one single city that sprawls the most in the United States. For one thing, researchers can't even agree on a definition for sprawl, and secondly, there are dozens of different metrics for measuring sprawl, and the ones chosen will have an impact on the overall results. That said, several studies have tried to measure sprawl and come up with cities that sprawl the most, and I'll share the results now. A 2003 study that considered residential density, land use mix, centrality, and street accessibility found that Atlanta, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and Riverside San Bernardino scored on the sprawl end of all metrics. One study used an entirely different set of methods that calculates the overall extent of a metropolitan area by analyzing the light from nighttime satellite photos. It then compares the new boundary with the population for an area to get an overall density. The all area like Minneapolis, St. Paul, Atlanta, Dallas, Fort Worth, St. Louis, and Kansas City have higher levels of sprawl than their coastal counterparts. A 2017 study of change in sprawl over time for the 51 largest metro areas found that Oklahoma City, Austin, and San Antonio are becoming less dense faster than any other metro areas. There are other studies, but this sampling shows the variety of metro areas named as having the most urban sprawl. Only one city was mentioned. Uh, sorry, I had to cut the video short, but I think you, I just wanted you to have an idea, a glimpse of what urban sprawl is like so that uh, it's very clear in your minds. And, and I wanted you to, to see that before we get into our discussions today. And in this discussion, uh, just let me share my screen again. Uh, the discussion. Sorry, sorry. On on the urban sprawl. Uh, I want you to look at the Kenyan example. Take Kenya as an example. And uh, in your groups, I want each group to pick its own, whatever. It doesn't matter if two different groups take a similar city. And I want you to tell me some of the characteristics of where are those cities where you think the, uh, the sprawl is happening? Uh, how is it characterized? Uh, how, how is that area like in terms of, of the roads, the infrastructure? Tell me what you think the area is like in terms of availability of water and other resources, uh, social amenities and also the use of cars, which people are living there, what kind of people are living in that places. Remember the sprawl happens outside areas. Which areas do you think that were once farmlands that are being turned into residentials? Do you know the, the names of those residential areas? What kind of people are living there? Uh, and, 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 and what are the housing patterns? And, and how? what about the their, their dependency on, on automobiles or cars for that, um, for that purpose. So I want you to get into your groups and, and start discussing this. So I'm just going to get into your groups very, very quickly. Trying to make sure everybody gets into a group. Abraham Lelgo, whoever this is, why are you always thrown out by, <laughs> by this? I'm giving you about, I, I want, I'm expecting a very, very, uh, whatever, very good quality work because as I say, this is this is something that you you guys know. It's it's not something you you know this. 
Uh, you already have areas in my so discuss that and let's come out with a few uh, some points and we compare with what that we have seen in the video where we have already touched on and see can we compare with what we are experiencing in Kenya. So I'm um, opening the rooms, make sure you go to your room and start the discussion. Hi guys. Anybody there? Tuko. Oh na unaweza ni refresh ya swali. Hizo maswali zilikuwa nyingi hata sije tunajibu gani. Sasa mimi kwenye nimeelewa we are supposed to uh, we are supposed to think of one one city well in my opinion i think nairobi will be the best because at least uko kuna different places and yet unaweza choose to discuss about kuliko na mombasa mombasa iko a bit maybe places kama nyali but nairobi maybe is iko there are more better options so the question is supposed to the questions were many we are supposed to discuss a city and phrase it in terms of the urban sprawl like eh hey, hey, zama swali zilikuwa nyingi yusuf hebu umeelewa nini hiyo swali wacha kuelewa mimi hata sijui swali ngani maswali mengi okay like ameuliza the urban sprawl tuchukue city moja alafu tuiongele in terms of user settlements settlement yenye tutachagua mbona tunafikiria hapo kuna urban sprawl uh, what kind of residents wanaishi hapo and then akasema tuseme um ni concepts kai ameuliza maswali mengi pita tu uja shika any of those questions thanks to Okay then kwa for, kwa kile ambacho nimesema nani ameelewa anything Ya yeah, hata mimi nasema Nairobi is better what do you guys think Ah tunaongelea urban sprawl So kila mtu aseme Kenya ameelewa jadi mimi na struggle na hii topic ya leo ya yeah, urban sprawl chagwe place moja amesema chagwe place moja alafu tu explain hiyo kitu okay see basically 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 urban urban sprawling sini si two settlements zenye ziko outside of town outside of the any of, of the iyo central district na zenye ziko ziko ni high density yani ziko na wase wengi plus congested yani alafu hizo social amenities tuseme kama mali ma shopping centers na na tuseme ma ni kidogo ya shall something like that and in that case
Eh, alafu pia bans pro lakuna akuna agriculture yenye na take place in such places. Sorry? I think using Nairobi as an example will be okay. Yeah, Nairobi is a good example. What do you think about the urban sprawl? I think pia tunafaa kuongelelea auto dependency of the people living there Nairobi Okay ebu elaborate on auto dependency I think in a focus on uh, how often the people use the cars way Eh hey, kitu kama hiyo How often how often people living in Nairobi use cars for transport, going to work, or to come here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk to you here. Okay, basically, Kenya Madam Ali to Tone Shapo ni sprawling Kenya Iliomoka. So when it comes to Africa, and not especially it's same Kenya, kama like Nairobi, majorly is urban sprawling in 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 form of kama slums you know like unplanned settlements kama tuseme slums ambayo ni people settle on on land which could probably be agricultural land alafu they they build settlements ambazo ziko na poor drainage alafu pia juu ziko congested kuna yani kuna a lot of pollution tuseme uh, katika hiyo land na katika pia water sources zenye ziko hapo na yeah basically ni hivyo well me Kenya naweza sema ukiangalia Nairobi place kama side za Mlolongo hapo sio Kimau nowadays kuko very developed na i'm not sure about your place when in Aitwa but ato kipita hapo na gari like that place is so dusty and there are like so many industries in that place alafu kuna kwa gani hiyo urban sprawl those na kwa ga urban where una find estates zimejengwa like nyingi everywhere you look kuna estates na of course kama ni hiyo mambo ya auto dependency unapata pollution lazima ikwe nyingi juu ya the the industries na also because of the the cars and the high life of those place those people yeah i also uh, to kiongelea hiyo auto auto wherever hiyo point ya people commuting i think pia ju most of the people live out uh, in the outskirts of the of the central district so they mainly depend on road for transport to say kama watu tuseme Nairobi like most people commute most people work uh, work in work in the central district lakini basically they live outside the district so most people commute using cars ndo maana inasababisha hiyo pia traffic jam along main roads kama tuseme Mombasa Mombasa road so basically most of the people living living in these urban sprawls depend on um, on road transport which could lead to a lot of pollution okay nice one
So mimi niko na swali does it mean that urban sprawl si lazima ikuwe urban settlements si lazima ikuwe watu wameamoka Okay me in, me in my opinion as in Okay we we come at same we can we can just use example from mahali si si tunaona you know like so an example of Nairobi like see si, hakuna tu hizo settlements peke yake ambazo ziko like za watu waliomoka peke yake so since since the city iko na wase wengi meaning, meaning kuna kuna wale wenye wameomoka na kuna wale mahaslas i think urban sprawl spaces na zina happen in uh, in his undeveloped settlements kama slums hivi i think is open tunaweza tunaweza classify kama urban urban spots sababu pia ni undeveloped yani oh, okay sa sa tuta Nanita. Hai no 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 hata kuna point nimeandika. Ah hapana. Mazee Yusuf. Mwapo uko ni mazee. Yusuf. the person you are talking to is <laughs> it's so much kwa kitabu na kalamu atemcheza ah we mtu msia niandike hizo points mimi nita present okay so to and to me to me to me ah uh, nasema Okay nani anaandika Nasema si tuanze basi tulichagua Nairobi Alafu Okay tunachagua Nairobi alafu tumesema Wewe tumesema nini tumesema um, kuna a lot of kuna a lot of pollution to ya also dependency in terms of ya mambo ya gari alafu tumesema agriculture agricultural uh, land haiko in such places huh? oh yeah uh-huh. 
urbanization. <laughs> Pia Yusuf alifema iyo. Ena mwalimu pia alifema tuseme kuhusu hizo amenities. Social amenities see buildings kama hospital, hospitals, build, nini schools. Somebody else, please, I contribute. I think place place kuna watu wengi social amenities kama hospital hospitals ziko ziko like ziko scarce as in as easy cater for the whole population because of the congestion and the high population
I hope everyone is back in. So I hope you had an interesting discussion. Uh, and let's hear from group one. Tell us the area you chose and whether you can pick up some salient features about those, that area. Group one. Okay, maybe they went away. Group two. Um, <clears throat> okay. In group two, uh, we decided on uh, Nairobi. Um, so about Nairobi, we basically we talked about the urban sprawling, which. Uh, uh, basically led to unplanned settlements in the outskirts of the city. And um, when we talked you. about... Let me stop you. I want you to name an area that is experiencing urban sprawl. Nairobi is a city in itself. It's a city centre. But what has happened? Which area? Name, take one of the areas and run with it. Yes, I was talking about that. So okay. we, we talked about the South Sea, South Bay area, where a lot of estates were developed outside the, outside the city. And um, <clears throat> um, most of the estates there lack uh, basic and um, schools also uh, are kind of far from where the people have settled. And also there is the water shortage problem and also uh, the waste disposal and sewage systems in this area is also poor. And um, another case we talked about is um, we, we, we weren't sure if we could classify them as urban sprawls. Like we also talked about the slums where uh, they are characterized by high density and a lot of pollution and also uh, we talked about um, a lot of uh, poor poor drainage systems in this area just, this just a minute just a minute Kalami Paul can you mute your microphone okay continue we also characterized them with um, a poor and um, poor sewage systems where case of River Nairobi was mentioned, where there's a lot of pollution taking place in on River Nairobi, especially from these areas. We also talked about, um, we also talked about uh, how people commute to the city, where road was the main, main uh, um, this commution, this commuting to towards the city basically leads to a lot of pollution, traffic jam, um, noise pollution in the city. So yeah, that's what we discussed. Okay, uh, okay, group two, I think there's a place where you missed the mark. And that's why I wanted you to watch the videos before, you know, at times you, you people confuse urban sprawl with slums. But it's, it's not about slums. No, 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 no. Look at the kind of buildings I was showing you. And, and, and the, the characteristics. So these places, I said urban sprawl is development that's taking place in low density areas that in those areas you hardly see any skyscrapers. It's just mostly housing units and that, housing units and that kind of thing. And they're also taking place in most cases in of these areas you find that people tend to use automobiles or cars to get to work and and when i already say that there should be some areas in kenya around nairobi city that immediately come to mind that that is why and that is why i wanted you to 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 watch the videos and to try and dissociate this as much as possible with the slums i know the slums are also unplanned 
the slums tend to be within the city. But what I'm talking about is people maybe who can afford to buy land and, and put up their cars, people who are tired of the pollution within the cities and they want to move away, that, that's the kind, that, that is what the urban sprawl is about. Okay, and that's why I really wanted you to watch those videos because if you don't watch, you easily confuse them with slums. It's the periurban, the suburbans. There's a, there's a Kipindi long time ago that used to be called suburban bliss. I don't know whether it's still, it's still, group group uh, group two somehow there's a place where you miss that that mark and, and I want that to be corrected within your minds even as you listen to the others presenting before you 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 leave this classroom and you go home with the wrong idea of what uh, what um, uh, urban sprawl is about so let's hear from group uh, group two so group one are they in? Okay, group one, I don't know where they disappear to. Group three, can we hear from group three? In, um, in group three, we, 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 we decided to come up, uh, we settled on an area, Kawangware. If you look at Kawangware and uh, the three factors, even on explain on the video, the low density, Kawangware fits in in that also outdoor dependent and there's a lot of land use mix those and uh if you look basically at kawangware there, there are no there are no high skyscraper buildings most of them are low buildings and they are most of them are similar and they're spread over a large area you know so kawangware best suit as a uh, urban urban sprawl area Did you, did you get Ian? That? Yes, did you get that? I, I want to hear more. Is that all you discussed in the 20 minutes that you discussed? We, we, we picked we picked uh, Kawangware and uh, Madare as the uh, no, area. No, 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 you guys, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. You're, you're mostly picking slum areas. And we already discussed these areas. We talked of Rongai. Yeah? yeah. We've talked of, of, of Fika, we've talked of Kiambu, we've talked of Kikui, where, where companies are buying land to develop estates. And, and, yeah. and who is going there? Most these people who have cars, who, can, who don't have to wait for a matter to, to go to the city center. Yeah. It's mostly the middle class that's going to those areas. They're the ones who are fueling the the urban sprawl uh it's it's also people who can afford to this or they can afford to buy or rent you see these are some of the char characteristics that should be able to guide you to, to your thinking urban sprawl is about slums no 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 not necessarily people in the slums uh will not even afford in fact Slums tend to develop very near the cities because most people cannot afford to commute. Yeah, but we are not talking about nice, nice housing units where people can either can buy or people can build for themselves according to plan. People don't have to wait for a matatu, they just get into a car and drive to the city and that kind of thing. This is what I'm talking about. So number group number three, I think you did this at the service you did not discuss i don't know what you are doing 20 minutes that's a long time so i, I i'm really not happy I, I think that was not good use of time can we hear from group four and group one we are waiting after group four it's group one so can he, we hear from group four thank you madam Oh, 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Though I think uh, there's some semblance to what I was talking about. I want to bring your minds back to the definition of urban sprawl. Because once we have the definition right, then we are going to choose, we are, we are going to think about the right areas. We say it's low density areas, it's outside the city in the suburban areas. And we already named a few when, when we were starting. We talked about Rungai, we talked about Kiambu, where, and we said where people are selling agricultural land to these real estate developers and they're putting up all these nice, beautiful apartments where people can buy or rent. Uh, we talked about, I think, Kikuyu, where people are also buying people people you can go by and, and, and develop in in places like the us it's large companies which is tend to buy and they they make uniform houses in 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 a place like kenya people buy land and they start developing their own land so everybody has their own design of the house they have their compound and that kind of thing and we also say the another characteristic of this uh this area is that most people most people so they, 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 they have their own characteristics because of that. One thing you'll notice is the jam, the traffic jams of people, because, because these places were unplanned for. So when people move towards that side and almost everybody has their own vehicle, what does that result in? Nairobi where you know, okay, I think this is where it's happening in Nairobi, this is where it's happening in Nairobi. So the people mostly who drive the up and sprawl. Yeah, forget about Wachana Namamboya slums, Kwanza, here to Yueke Kando. It's true they are unplanned and everything. Characteristics. You see, we realize that most people within the slums mostly would have a walking distance to the, to the city. They, they would not live so far from the city because it's expensive to commute, okay? That's okay, we know that. But let's look at these others that are slowly creeping into agricultural land and they're taking away a lot of land, okay? And, and people in those areas where these agri the agricultural, they are, they are happily selling this, this land to, to these people because they are making better money than growing crops. Okay. And this in itself is going to have consequences. As we have said, it is going to have consequences because slowly, gradually, without even realizing, we are reducing our acreage for arable land without even thinking about it. 
And why is all this happening? Because we do not have land use plans. Counties still are not yet strong enough to say for, for this county, this land has been set aside for agriculture. So even if you buy it, if you're not going to practice agriculture, forget about it. We, we are not yet there. Okay? So because you're not yet there, if somebody comes with very good money, the, the, the owner of the land will sell it. And then that person will say, oh, it's my land. I can do whatever I want to do with it. Why? Just because maybe the counties do not have a plan yet. They say, okay, fine, you bought the land, but I'm sorry. If you're not practicing residential houses, you're not going to develop real estate here because it's been planned for. Okay, so that is why I want you to think widely because the consequences we are following through, even as we discuss this topic, this is this this thing is happening, but it has its own consequences. When we looked at those pictures the pictures uh, of, of those cities uh, in the US, the urban pro, you're like, wow, this is very good. This is looking like it's very well planned. Uh, these people are so organized. Yes, and everything. But uh, yeah, and it sounds like this in your Jipanga, Nikweli, but I told you, we are all swimming in the same pool. We are all facing the problems of this kind of um, and uh, this kind of unplanned growth. We are all going through this problem. So let's go back to the problems associated with unplanned growth, okay? So this is where I want you now, let's look at it now even more critically. And, and as we read through this, think about Kenya, think about the problems that we already have even on the roads and everything. So can we identify with this? Okay. So one of the problem is transportation. Those areas where those very, you see within the city, the trans land and all that kind of thing. But once you start getting out of the city, you realize uh, there was very little thought to the transportation corridors. So probably you see that the area has grown so much, almost everybody has a car, but the road, the road is not enough. So what happened? It jumps, okay? Uh, and then, uh, of course, now of, of, of new corridors to, to, to also stimulate growth in the near. Once, for example, the thicker superhighway was introduced, you know, also what has happened to the growth in that in those areas it has just gone on and on okay um for example in in the u.s i'm giving an example they're saying in the u.s one person will spend nine hours per week in an automobile that means in a jam or on transit from one point to another nine hours is one week so it's one day more than one working day. So you can imagine all those productive hours are just spent inside the car, either in a jam or moving from one place to another. Okay. And, and you may think this is not important, but I think once we start talking about sustainable cities, it, it will be glaring. You will see actually why this is bad. Okay. So hold on to your thoughts. And I want you to open up your minds. I don't want to to, to just keep thinking of the slums in Kenya. No, 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 you are getting it wrong. Once you're stuck in the slums in, of Kenya, you'll not be able to look at the bigger picture. You'll not, be, you'll not be able to look what is wrong with our Rongai, what is wrong with our thicker, high, what is, what is then we can be able to think of real solutions, okay. I'm not a city planner and that kind of thing, but I just think you need to look at this uh, from a wider lens. Then there is, of course, the, air, the issue of air pollution. Remember, they said, oh, we're moving out of the city center because of pollution. Once you go into those uh, suburban areas and, 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 and traffic increases, it's because almost everybody has a car, what happens? The air pollution increases. You, 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 
Yeah, that is not uh, rocket science. It just goes automatically. The air, the air pollution increases. Then now, if you have to put up infrastructure, if you have to put up infrastructure, it is going to be expensive. Because remember, all this was not planned for. All this was not planned for. And it is just like coming and, and, and finding a place is already existing. So how do we uh, deal with this? Then the other problem, and uh, I think we are going to, to look at this even more when we are in the next topic. This is going to be very, very relevant. The loss of open space. Farmland is part of the open space. Okay. Uh, what happens in those, like the first picture I showed you, I don't know that where that is, city is. Can you, did you see any open space? I think what you saw are just houses upon houses, upon houses, upon houses, just a dense, and I think that was an aerial photo. And you almost wonder, where are the playing fields? Where is the open space? Where, where do you go out to relax? And that kind of thing. So this is another problem. Farmlands are part of open space, and even undeveloped land is part of open space. Once you lose this, there are consequences, and we are going to look at them in, in the, I think, next week. Or two. Yeah. Then, the, of course, this is what I've been talking about, the loss of farmland. Uh, we know that land is very important. We know that is where we are growing our crops, OK? We say flat, well-drained land is ideal for both farmland and ideal urban development. A conflict already. That is where the farmer wants to farm. But also that is where the urban developers say, oh, this is a very nice area where people can settle and everything. OK, so if you don't have a plan, you can already see there is going to be conflict. And the one with the bigger money will win. Will. Uh, and then at times people say, oh, we are only going to, to develop part of this land. The rest will be left uh, intact. But we know that partial transformation will often lead to a whole transformation. You start off with a few houses, a few estates, and before you know it, all the open land or all the farmland was taken, and that's it. Things are gone. Then, of course, there's the issue of water pollution problems. So the police, the problems that you ran away from the city uh, start coming in. Remember, if you didn't have a proper sewage system, and I have seen this in Kenya, because for you to have a very, very good development, from the sewage disposal, your power source, the source of the amenities that you need within that, you need to think about all this. Uh, but it's really, it's really true. It's really thought through. You said we do things, but you don't think about the consequences. Then, of course, there's the, the flood plain problem. Like uh, in... Uh, Mombasa City, if you go to an area like Kimbeni, Kimbeni is good area. It's nice, nice, nice buildings. But Kimbeni, so that's why it happens when it rains a lot. Go to no much in the water, but if you have to get is very good. Why? Because it was just developed in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the issue of the floodplains and people wanted, there, there are very many cities in the world that have been developed on floodplains. Floodplains are very, very nutrient rich. They're good areas for farming. They're good areas for, 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 for crop production. Yeah. So uh, I think with, with time, like in the U.S. now, there are very many communities that have come up with, uh, with ordinances or, or, or laws concerning their floodplains that they have zoned it, or rather they have planned for it. They say you cannot do these kind of activities. 
not maybe probably uh, develop a, a, a residential estate here because it's a flood plain. Okay. So then we also have the issue of energy efficiencies. Uh, and already we can see automobiles. Automobiles are cars and whatever goes on the road. Automobiles are inefficient transportation. And I think yeah, we are going to look at this probably not today, but yeah. Everybody is in their own car. Everybody is spending all that time on the road. What is wrong with this? Uh, you may ask. And, and the way me, when I finish uh, my studies, I want to work hard and buy my own car. What, what is wrong with these things? They, they, they sound like development and what we are looking for. Okay, we are going to look. When you look at the sustainable cities, probably you decentralized cities. This is now the, the suburban area. So you live in the, 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 the city center and you're going into, into you more emissions, most definitely. Then got uh, single family homes or the units uh, where everybody wants to probably just have their own home, their, their own uh, what, bungalow. Their... What happens? When we start living like this, there's less loss of sense of community. And I think it's creeping in Kenya very, very easily. Where you're living here and you don't care or you don't know what, who your next door neighbors is and you don't care to know. So it's you, yourself, and your family, Kwisha Maneno. Then what is happening to the central city? It is dying, the city, the central city, because people have moved away from it. The central city, if you look, for example, in Nairobi central city, it was so well planned. And you're like, what happened to our plans? Did we throw away our plans? Now you go out of, of the central city, just go out. And you're just what is happening here. Okay. Then, uh, then, of course, we've talked about wetland. They have they can make a way for housing estates. Some have been filled. Some have been used as landfills. You see, totally ignoring the natural wetlands. Totally ignoring. And of course, nature always hits back at us. Okay. And we say if they play a role in productive phase of organism, they provide for sediment filtration. They are the ones that carry the excess flood water. We decide we don't need the wetland and we go and fill it up or we drain it. When the flood waters, even if they come once in 10 years, they leave devastation. Okay, and then also in some cities, just because of also some very poor planning, some cities have found themselves built on fault lines. Yeah, because you didn't ask anybody, you didn't. Uh, and, and remember, I don't know whether we want to go back to that very first lecture when you're talking about land use planning, where you bring in all the experts, including geologists, we look at that land and tell, oh, this is an economic, this is a volcanic, uh, this area is, has some volcanic activity, or there, there are some fault lines along this area. So we, we would not recommend for any residential areas around this place. I think you, we also, what happened, what was happening, was it in Congo uh, during this, uh, just like two weeks ago, where people are living near this uh, volcanic area and, and the volcanoes are just spewing. And you're like, wait a minute. Did, did someone encourage or advise the government to make sure they build their residential? They don't develop this, those areas as residentials. They keep away from the area. Okay. Uh, and, and zone of that area as an area maybe to carry out apart from being a residential areas. 
And remember also, I think in SMR 311, when we are talking about some cyclic events in an area, the place principle, it may take place even once in 10 years or once in 20 years, but you can be sure the cycle always comes back. So when you have done a very good land planning uh, activity, you will be able to know this area, we will, we will leave them for this activity, these areas we can use them for this activity. But with unplanned, uh, uh, unplanned uh, development, uh, an area looks good, you go for it and you don't, whatever. So what is the solution? What exactly are we looking for? Why are we dissatisfied with smart growth? Okay. And, and why does it, sorry, sorry, not smart growth. Why are we dissatisfied with urban sprawl? It's because it has problems. Uh, are there some solutions? Is there anything that can guide us so that we avoid, we avoid getting into problems the way uh, we already have in some areas? Is there something, are there lessons that we can learn? Let us see, let us see that. So I want us to, to show the video uh, on uh, some smart growth principles. For just sixty-seven dollars, you can make as many videos as you. So, let me share a video. So, uh, probably you're wondering why. What is the problem with these very nice-looking places? Yeah, but I want us to see what are there some things that we can learn and can things be better, can things be done better than the way they are doing So let me add to the complexity of the situation we find ourselves in. We're solving for climate change. We're going to be building cities for 3 billion people. That's a doubling of the urban environment. If we don't get that right, I'm not sure all the climate solutions in the world will save mankind. Because so much not just environmental impacts, but our social well-being, our economic vitality, our sense of community and connectedness. Fundamentally, the way we shape cities is a manifestation of the kind of humanity we is, I think, the order of the day. And to a certain degree, getting it right can help us solve climate change because in the end, it's our behavior that seems to be driving the problem. Uh, the problem isn't free-floating, and it isn't just ExxonMobil and, and oil, oil companies, companies. How, we how we live. live. There's, There's a villain in the story, it's, it's called, called Sprawl, and I'll, and I'll be upfront up front about, about that. that. But it's but not it's just the kind of sprawl you think of, or many, many people think of, as low-density low development out of the periphery of the metropolitan area. area. Actually, Actually, I think that sprawl can happen anywhere at any density. The key attribute is that it isolates people. It segregates, it segregates people, people into, into economic, economic enclaves, enclaves and land use enclaves. enclaves. It separates them from nature. Uh, it doesn't allow the cross-fertilization, the interaction that makes cities great places and that makes society thrive. thrive. And, so and so the antidote to sprawl is really what we all need to be thinking about, about especially, especially when we're when taking, we're taking on, this on this massive construction, construction project. project. So let, so me, let take me take you through, you through one, one exercise. exercise. We did we this, did we built, developed, developed a model, model for the state of California, California so they could get on, get on with reducing carbon, carbon emissions. emissions. Uh, uh, we, we did a whole, whole series of, of uh, scenarios, scenarios for how, how the, state the state could grow. grow. And, and this, this is, is just, just one overly, overly simplified, simplified one. one. We, we mixed, mixed different, different development prototypes and said they're going to carry us through the year 2050, 10 million new 
crew uh, in our state of California. And one was sprawl. It's just more of the same shopping malls, subdivisions, office parks. The other one was dominated by not everybody moving to the city, but just compact of them. What we used to think of as streetcar suburbs, walkable neighborhoods, low rise, but integrated, integrated mixed-use mixed use environments. environments. And, the, and, the, and the results, results are, astounding. are astounding. They're, They're astounding, astounding not just for the scale of the difference of this, of this one shift in our city-making city habit, habit, but, but also uh, because, uh, because each, each one represents, represents a special interest group. group. A special, a special interest, interest group that used to advocate for their concerns, concerns one at a time. time. They, they did not see what I call co-benefits of, of urban, urban form, form and, and th that, that allows, allows them, them to, join to join with others. With others. So, so land, land consumption, consumption environmentalists, environmentalists are, really are really concerned about this. About this. So, so are farmers. Are farmers. Uh, there's, there's a whole, a whole range, range of people, people. And, and of course, of course neighborhood, neighborhood groups that want open space nearby. nearby. The, sprawl the sprawl version of California, California is almost doubles the urban, the physical, the physical footprint. footprint. Greenhouse gas, tremendous savings because in California our biggest carbon emission comes from cars. And, and cities, cities that, that don't, don't depend, depend on, on cars, cars as much, much obviously create huge, huge savings. savings. Vehicle, Vehicle miles, miles travel, that's, that's what I was, I was just talking, talking about. about. Just, just reducing, reducing the average 10,000 10, miles per household per year, per year from, from some, some somewhere in the mid-26,000 per, per household, has a has huge impact, impact not just on air quality, quality and carbon, carbon, but also, but also on, on the household pocketbook. pocketbook. It's, it's very, very expensive, expensive to drive, drive that much. much. And, as and as we've, we've seen, seen, the middle class is struggling to hold on. on. Health you know, we're, you know, talking, we're talking, talking about how do you, how do you fix, fix it once we broke it, it, clean the air. Why, why not, not just stop polluting? polluting? Why, why not, not just use our feet and bikes more? And that's a function of the kinds of cities that we shape. Household costs. 2008, 2008 was a, was a mark in time, time, not of just, just financial industry, industry running, running amok. It was, it was that, that we, we were trying to sell too many of the wrong kind of housing. housing. Large, Large lot, single family, family distant, distant, too, too expensive, expensive for the average, average middle class, class family to afford, and quite frankly, frankly not a good fit to their, their lifestyle, lifestyle anymore. anymore. But, but in, in order, order to move, move inventory, you can discount the financing and get it sold. I think that's a lot of what happened. Reducing, Reducing costs, costs by $10,000. Remember, California, California the median is $50,000. This is a big element. element. That's, That's just cars and utility costs. costs. So, the so the affordable housing, housing advocates, who often sit off on their silo, separate, separate from the environmentalists, separate, separate from the, uh, the, 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 the politicians, everybody, everybody fighting, fighting with everyone, everyone is now, now beginning to see common cause. And I think the common cause is what really brings about the change. Los, Los Angeles, Angeles, as a, as a result, result of these, these efforts, efforts, has now, now decided, decided to transform, transform itself into a more, more transit-oriented transit environment. environment. As a matter, as a matter of fact, since 08, they voted in $400 billion dollars of bonds for, for transit, transit as, as opposed to, and $0, zero dollars for new highways. highways. What, a what a transformation. transformation. LA, LA becomes a, a city of walkers in transit, not a city of cars. How does it happen? You take, you take the, the least, least desirable, desirable land, land, the strip, the strip you, you add, add where there's space, space transit, transit, and then, and then you infill uh, mixed-use mixed use development. development. Uh, you, uh, you satisfy, satisfy new housing, housing demands, and you, you make the existing neighborhoods, neighborhoods all around it more, around it, more complex, complex, more interesting, more, more walkable. walkable. Okay. okay, here's, here's another, another kind of sprawl. Of sprawl. China, China high-density high sprawl, what you, what you think, think of as an oxymoron, oxymoron. But, but the same, same problems, problems. Everything, everything isolated, isolated in super blocks, blocks. And, and of course, of course this, this amazing smog that was just spoken to. 12% of, of GDP, GDP in, China in China now is spent on the health impacts of, of that. that. The, history, the history, of course, of Chinese, Chinese cities, cities is robust. robust. It's like any other place. Community was all about small local shops and local services, walking, Interacting, interacting with your neighbors, your neighbors may, may sound, sound utopian, utopian, but it's but not. It's actually, it's actually what, people what people really want. want. The, the new super blocks, blocks these, these are blocks, blocks that would have 5,000 5, units, units in them. In them. And, and they're, they're dated, dated as well because, because nobody, nobody knows, knows anybody, anybody else. else. And, of, and course, of course, there isn't even a sidewalk. No ground floor shops. A very sterile environment. I found this one case here in one of the super blocks where people had illicitly set up shops in their garages so that they could have that kind of local service of people to get it right. 
All right. All right. Some, some, more, some technical, technical planning, planning stuff. stuff. John Cheney. Is... This is a this small, small growth, growth area. area. They wanted, they wanted us, us to test the alternative, the alternative to sprawl, to sprawl yeah, in, in, in several, several cities, cities across, across China. China. This, this is, is for four and, and a half million, million people. people. What, what the takeaway from this, from this image is, is every one of those circles is a walking radius around a transit, transit station. station. Massive, Massive investment, investment in Metro and, and BRT, and a and distribution that allows everybody, everybody to walk, work, work within, within walking, walking distance of that. that. The red, the red area, area, this is a blow-up. Blow up. All of All a sudden, of a preserving the important, important ecological features, features. And, and then those, those other streets in there are auto-free streets. So, so instead, instead of bulldozing, bulldozing leveling, leveling the site, and building, and building right, right up to the, up to the river, river, this green edge, edge was, was something that really wasn't normative, normative in China, China until uh, these set, set of practices began uh, experimentation, experimentation there. there. The, the urban, urban fabric, fabric, small, small blocks, blocks, maybe 500, 500 families, families per block, block. They, they know each other. other. The, the street, street, street perimeter, perimeter has shops, and so, and so there's local, local destinations. destinations. And, the and the streets themselves become smaller because, because there are more of them. them. Very, Very simple, simple straightforward, straightforward uh, urban, urban design. design. Now, here, now here, you here you have something, something I, I, dearly I dearly love. love. Think, Think of the, of the logic. logic. If only, if only a, third a third of the people, of the people have, have cars, why do we give 100% of our streets to cars? What if we gave 70% of the streets to car free, free to everybody, everybody else, else so, so that the, the transit, transit could move, move well, well for them, them so, so that they, they could walk, walk so they could buy. Why, why not, not have, have geographic, geographic equity, equity in, in our, our cir circulation, circulation system? system. Um, uh, and, and quite frankly, frankly cities, cities would function, function better. better. Uh, uh, no, matter no matter what they do, they do no matter how many ring roads they build in Beijing, they just can't overcome complete gridlock. So this is an auto-free street, mixed use along the edge, uh, uh, it, has it has transit, transit running, running down, down the middle. middle. I'm, I'm happy, happy to make, to make that, that transit, transit autonomous, autonomous vehicles, vehicles, but maybe, maybe I'll have I'll a chance to talk, to talk about, about that later. later. So there so are there seven, seven principles that have, that have now, now been adopted, been adopted uh, by, by the highest, highest levels, levels in the Chinese, the Chinese government, government, and they're, and they're moving, moving to implement them. them. And they're simple, and they are globally, I think, universal principles. One is to preserve the natural environment, the history, and the critical agriculture. Second, Second is mix. Mixed mix use, use is popular, popular but, but when I say mix, I mean mixed mix incomes, incomes mixed mix age groups, groups, as well as mixed mix land use. Walk. walk. There's, There's no, no great, great city, city that, you that you don't enjoy, enjoy walking, walking in. in. You, you don't, don't go, go there. there. Places, places you go on you go vacation are places, places you can walk. walk. Why, Why not make it everywhere? Bike is the most efficient means of transportation you know. China has now adopted policies that put six meters of bike lane Back to their, their, their biking, biking history. history. Uh, uh, complicated complicated planners planner here. here. Connect. Connect. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, a, street a street network, network that, allows that allows many routes instead of singular routes, routes and, and provides, provides many, many kinds, kinds of streets, streets instead, instead of just, just one. one. Uh, uh, ride. We, well, have, we to have to invest, invest more in transit. transit. There's, There's no, no silver bullet. bullet. Uh, uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicles, vehicles are not going to solve this for us. As a matter of fact, they're going to generate more. Uh, traffic, uh, traffic, more, more VMT, VMT than, than the alternative. The alternative. And, and focus. focus. We, have we have a hierarchy, hierarchy of, of the city based, based on transit, transit rather, rather than, than the, the, arm, the, the old armature, armature of, of freeways. freeways. It's, it's, a, a, it's a big, big paradigm, paradigm shift. shift. Uh, uh, but, those but those two things, things have, have to get, get reconnected in ways that really shape the structure of the city. So I'm very hopeful. Uh, in, uh, in California, California United, United States, States, China, China these, these changes, changes are well accepted. Are well accepted. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful, hopeful for two reasons. reasons. One, One is most people get it. Uh, they, uh, they understand intrinsically what a great city can and should be. be. And, the, and second the second is that the kind, the kind of analysis, analysis we can bring, bring to bear, bear now allows people to connect the dots, dots. allows people to shape political coalitions that didn't exist in the past. That, that allows, allows them, them to bring, bring into being, being the, the kinds of communities, of communities we, all we all need. need. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, what do you think about that video? Just want uh, one or two comments. Just your overall 
take home from that video. Zebola, Gube. Is Zebola in? Kiremi in Katha. No. Jacinta and Tenya. Are you in? Jacinta? Kadua wa Kahiga? Are you in? Okay, where are these people? Joseph Mwendwa? Kalami Paul? Yes. You are the only one in. What, what's your concern? Did you watch the uh, video? I think it's all about uh, planning of uh, cities and urban areas. And, uh, trying as much as possible to prevent sprawling of, of people. OK, thank you. Malevi Kitome, are you in? Malevi? Summer Boas? Is Summer Boas in? There is Louis Lumni, Louis Lumumba Muema. Lumumba? Fabian Nyakundi. Munyao Mulango. Okeri Nyamoita. Mate. Mate. Chitu, are you in? I'm, I'm okay. Okay, you look well happy. Okay, I was in. I'm in class. Okay, so what was your take on the video? Uh, according to the video, and uh, what I've learned is that most cities are going back to uh, trying to come up with sustainability, avoid pollution. In cities such as in China, they are going back to using bikes as the mode of transport within the cities as well as walking. So they are trying to use methods to reduce climate change. Okay, thank you. Yusuf Omar? Kiremi Nkata? Tiamborimba. Okay. So I'm going to put another video on. Uh, Anyoso. Okay. As for me from the video, I think uh, this person is trying to create some awareness on how we can be able to achieve sustainable cities and also giving the approximation of probabilities from how other cities have, uh, have managed and they are adapting. And by doing so, we can combat uh, many challenges that uh, many cities are facing with the climate change, air pollution, and, uh, and so many others. So that is what I think that person was trying to instill into people that it can be attainable. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm going to put up another video uh, and I'm going to base your cut one on these two videos. So uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, I've reached a point where I, I think people are playing around. We only have 19 attendants. When it comes to the cut, I'll have 36 people wanting to do the cut. And this time around, I'm, I'm not joking around. I am going to be so, so strict because you are supposed to be in class. We only have 19 people attending and there's supposed to be 36 people in attendance of this class. And I told anybody, if you have a problem, let me know in advance. So uh, fine, that's okay for those who are in. So I want to show you another video. The, if you realize the, old, the, the person, the, the presenter, the by the way, TED talks are very, very good. They're normally very, very good talks to listen to. Because you're very well balanced, very well researched. And, and, and I encourage and encourage my students to watch as many TED talks on different topics as possible. So I want us to look at um, uh, China. China has been mentioned, and you can already imagine with China, the issues of urban sprawl is tremendous. But I want us to look at one of China's cities that has, actually has gone self-sufficient. Okay. And uh, I want to see what is it that they have done that we can, we can learn. Because remember, today, today you're watching. Tomorrow you'll be the one implementing. Okay. So we want to spend some time watching these. And then from there, Over 100 100 square, square kilometers, kilometers uh, around 38 point. Populated with 20.9 million. Let's uh, watch a bit of it. Unity that's, that's built, to built to be locked, locked down, down sounds, sounds really, really, really appealing. Really appealing. Well, well, that's, that's the, case the case for a residential, residential area, area in the upcoming, upcoming Chinese, Chinese city of Xiong'an, new, new area. area. Today, Today, we're going, we're going to see what this enticing community is all about, especially when it comes to the astonishing. So can you all see the screen? Yes. So I'm going back just a minute. And you need to one microphone. Yeah, we're getting to hear some echoes. eco-living capabilities that are built within. We'll see all of its features and prices. On top of that, we'll also explore how this new city was created and the mammoth cost. So let's get started. Before we can talk about the green community, we first have to see what the Xiong'an new area is all about. The idea was first disclosed all the way back in 2017 and will be headed by China's president, Xi Jinping. Located in the province of Hebei, the new area was put together to ease pressure on China's capital city of Beijing. Populated with 20.9 million people, the streets of Beijing are clogged with cars, while the nearby city of Tianjin has a population of around 13.8 million. Xiong'an new area is situated 100 kilometers, around 62 miles, southwest of Beijing and 100 kilometers west of Tianjin. Also during 2017, Beijing stated they would invest 18.2 billion yuan, about $2.8 billion, to combat air pollution. By creating the Xiong'an new area, the idea is that people will leave Beijing and Tianjin in particular to move to the new city. And it worked right off the bat. After the announcement, people flocked to the new area to purchase any properties that were already in the location with the hope to then sell them off later for a big profit. Soon, the roads were blocked off with vehicles attempting to get into the area and the local hotels filled with guests. The initial development for Xiong'an new area was for 100 square kilometers, around 38.6 square miles, yet there are plans for it to reach a whopping 2,000 square kilometers, around 772.2 square miles. That's nearly twice the size of the city of Indianapolis in Indiana at 936.3 square kilometers. In 2020, a competition was run for architects to have their work showcased in Xiong'an new area. The competition was defined as Xiong'an Architectural Design Contest with Chinese characteristics under the high quality development principle. There were six categories and more than 300 entries altogether. For the residential and communities category, the winning plan was by Guayart Architects. 
Founded in 1993 by Vicente Guayart in Barcelona, Spain, the prestigious firm has headed projects all over the globe. When speaking about the inspiration for the design, the studio director, Honorata Grzesikowska, stated, The entire team worked from home, and we decided to include all those aspects that could make our lives better. The group created a mixed-use community that can be the blueprint for cities around the world. In case of another recent worldwide issue, or something else, the area would be able to produce its own energy and food. The area focuses on circular bioeconomy. What this essentially means is that it takes inspiration from a circular economy, where pollution and waste are minimized for environmental protection and reuse, as well as creating renewable energy and resources to make food, materials, and so on. Guayart Architects' design combined the European courtyard-style city blocks found in regions like Barcelona with modern Chinese housing towers. The blocks will have housing, offices, retail, schools, a swimming pool, and a firehouse. All of the buildings will be constructed with cross-laminated timber. Cars will be restricted to certain areas, whilst deliveries will be conducted by drones. Each apartment will also have, adorably, its own bird box and shelves for swallows to nest in. 5G will also be implemented in order to make working at home or working in the community's public spaces as seamless as possible. One area of the community would consist of numerous greenhouses in order to grow food, which will consist of hydroponic farming and LED lights. Some of the largest farmer-inspired greenhouses can cost upwards of $23,000. There will also be what's described as co-working digital factories. These rooms will consist of 3D printers and rapid prototyping machines. In case of a disruption in the supply chain, these machines can create tools or replacement pieces for broken devices. Large industrial 3D printers can cost upwards of $10,000. The roofs are mostly sloped to hold solar panels. Many of the sloped roofs will contain solar panels. According to the Center of Sustainable Energy, the average 5-kilowatt residential system of solar panels usually costs $15,000 to $25,000 to install, while Tesla's solar roof can cost $34,300 for a 2,000-square-foot home. All the garden spaces, both private and public, will all host butterfly-friendly flowers to welcome nature into the new city area. Work on building Xiong'an New Area is still underway. Around 120 projects are in the midst of being created with 160,000 workers. Most steel rebar employees are bringing in 10,000 yuan, around $1,550 per month. It's expected that by 2035, Xiong'an will be a modern green city. One of the contributors is the global architectural firm Chapman Taylor. They helped design Xiong'an New Area Urban Master Plan. One of their biggest selling points is that everything someone will require is just a 15-minute walk away. As the company states, the spatial layout ensures that educational, commercial, medical, public transportation, cultural, and sports facilities are all provided within a walkable distance. It's been estimated that the whole of the Xiong'an new area will cost 4 trillion yuan, around $621.7 billion, to build over the next two decades. This is mostly down to the fact that the area was rural at the time. As such, logistic costs for workers and materials would up the price substantially. Back in 2018, the UK government co-founded the creation of a technology center in Xiong'an. The deal between the UK and China was reported to cost $11.8 billion at the time. In order to focus on becoming a green city, the Xiong'an authorities announced services to allow the public to report environmental violations in exchange for a reward. The cash incentive ranges from 500 to 5,000 yuan, around 78 to 777 dollars. Back in 2018, Xiong'an even received investment from the state-owned oil company Sinopec. They were looking to fund new energy, green products, and artificial intelligence within the new area. The funding was for 10 billion yuan, nearly 1.6 billion dollars. One of their biggest projects was opened in December 2020, the Xiong'an Railway Station. With 13 platforms and 23 lines, the station takes up 475,000 square meters, around 5.1 million square feet. In order to stick to the green plan for the city, the station's unique roof is covered in solar panels. According to reports, this alone cost 30 million yuan, or $4.7 million, while the whole station is reported to have cost 8
around $1.2 billion. Soon after, the Beijing Xiong connecting various stations in Beijing to Xiong'an was opened to the public. Hours websites were sold out of tickets as train enthusiasts snapped up seats. The top speed for bullet trains on this track is 350 kilometers per hour, around 218 miles per hour. The line itself is 91 kilometers long, or 57 miles. Tickets originally cost between 48 and 68 yuan, or 7.5 to 10.6 dollars. Final fact finish! Another metropolis currently being created is the King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia. Originally conceived in 2005, the mega project was headed by the late King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. The near 70 square mile city is set to open around 2000. Okay, enough of that. If you're not inspired, I don't know how to inspire you. What are your thoughts? And, and think outside, just tell me you just that free thought that doesn't even have to be academic. What do you think? When you think of Kenya, when you think about some of these countries, where are we really? Hamisi Hamis, Uko. Hamisi Hamis. Yeah, yes. what do you think? So watching that video, after looking at the dreams of countries, after, after listening to the TED talk, I don't know whether you are in, what are I you thinking? In. Yeah, what do you think? Just tell me your free thoughts after watching those two. They don't even have to be academic. Tell me. We are so far behind. Why? Are we, are we, why? What's wrong with us? I think we should start thinking on how we can develop our areas and how we can generate enough so that we can succeed in doing that. Okay, yeah. So are you thinking, because I tend to think that um, taking care of environmental principles uh, the person who was talking in the TED talk talked about um, communities uh, <clears throat> trying to stop the urban sprawl and, and coming up with, with places where, or cities where people are living. There's a sense of community, there's mixed use. Mixed use means that you're getting people of all age groups, you're getting places where people can connect, people can work. And, and for me, I think one of the things that's coming up very clearly is walkable community, uh, walkable cities, whereby the use of cars is being limited seriously. You know, when we talk about climate change and we're talking about emissions, and, and at times we get stuck in thinking, I don't think this problem can ever end. I, I think we all need cars and that kind of thing. But I think we can already see that there are some people who are taking this very, very seriously. And, and the simple thing is fine. Why are people traveling so much? It's because most people are going to work on a daily basis. Why do they have to travel so far? Because they live so far from work. So the new concept of cities, what you're calling sustainable cities, green cities, is can we make our cities workable? Can we make sure that where people are living, it's from a walking distance from, from where they, 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 they work. So they don't need a car. And if it's a bit further, get onto your bike and ride. Okay. And, and I think for me, it's coming out very, very clearly. In, in Africa, I think we are still stuck. We still have to have so many cars now before we start thinking of a bicycle. If I see somebody cycling to work, oh, that's a poor person. Uh, you, you, and, and, and we deride that, we despise that. But we can see where, what cities have started going back to, huge mega cities. If you think about the investment that China is putting in, into that new city, or even in the city of California, where 
where we saw that in their budget, uh, there was no budget to include new highways. So in short, they are saying our, our priorities are not cars. Our priorities are people. Can we make people live in a city where you can walk around? Uh, let me talk about Nairobi city. And because at least the first two years of your whatever were in Nairobi, what's your experience in Nairobi city when it comes to walkability? Is Nairobi city a city we can say that you can walk seriously? Who wants to respond to that? Don't wait for me to pick you. Who wants okay, to respond? Madam, if, if I may respond. Nairobi, okay. if I may respond. Nairobi has a long way to go, but uh, if I go back to the transport part, uh, Nairobi now is implementing BRT. If you look along, if we look along the Nairobi Super Highway, uh, this construction of the BRT, uh, they, want, they want to put up the electric buses and the stops in uh, every. There are many stops along along the highway, so they want to get away with the the matatus so that people can be using the the BRT buses. You know, that's yeah. that that's a plus. That's a plus for Nairobi. But on the flip side, there's a, what the government is implementing now, the Nairobi Expressway. That is a bad thing for me, because it's when you when you see how that expressway has been built, many trees were cut to build bigger highways. I don't I don't think we need the bigger highways because all that big bigger highways will create more cars will be there. That's more pollution. So Nairobi will be more polluted than even before. They've even encroached Uhuru Park. You see, that's a that's a negative negative thing. You see. But the PRT thing, the PRT thing is a good thing. Yes, that's what I may add on the on the two videos. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ian. That's a that's a good observation. Um, the what was I asking about? Uh, the 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 BRT, the buses. I, I think they are. They are, they are overdue. They, they should have arrived several years back, uh, but we hope that they, they are coming. Uh, but there's also the, 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 the train, which actually the government should be very, very serious. I know there are plans. I don't know how they've started. We've got the one from Siokimau, but we are really hoping that the rail uh, issue is going to be taken so seriously, not just even by the current government, but even in the subsequent government that they are going, we, we need to decongest our roads. It is not maybe, it is, we need to decongest them. Uh, before you answer that, Ian, I was asking, how is your experience working in Nairobi? Can we call Nairobi a walkable city? So somebody else wants to contribute? Kerry Komwenga. Nairobi is not workable because people travel from far distances. Personally, I have an experience of my uncle works from works in Nairobi but travels from Tika. Okay, every single day they are traveling, <laughs> he's traveling from Tika to, to Nairobi. Yes. Wow. Uh, what about when you're in the city? How walkable is it? You're, okay, you're not on the car, but you're just walking on the streets of Nairobi. What's your experience? Nairobi is hectic. The traffic jams, the congestion in the streets, and test cases. Okay, tell, tell me, now for the city planners, do you think they had the pedestrians in mind? Look at... I'm thinking of these streets where the matatus also are. Look at all those streets in um, where this uh, there's a street around Odeon. There's a street leading to to the post buses. There is that street leading to the Tomboya streets and everything. Do you think the city ever had pedestrians in mind? 
and especially with the ever increasing population. Do you think anybody has been thinking about pedestrians? For me, I may say they, they, they did consider the pedestrians because if you look at a street like um, Kenyatta Avenue, it has been it has been rehabil rehabilitated recently. They have uh, they have uh, they have made the places a bit walkable. Okay, on the on the downside, Tomboya streets still uh, there's a lot to be done because matatus are encroaching. But uh, I think the government uh, tried to solve that problem by this. They they create they've created now the green bus terminals, where the matatus will not be will be, not be around the cities. They will be using. Uh, They'll be parking um, adjacent uh, railway club. That's where the, the 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 green terminals is. So that will reduce in future. We still have a way to go, but there are places in Nairobi now you can walk. General Body did a good thing compared to Sonko. So there are places now in Nairobi you can walk uh, freely and uh, and enjoy and enjoy Nairobi space. Okay. Thank you, Ian. I've not been to Nairobi since COVID. So uh, uh, my experience in Nairobi is that there's no priority. In most of those streets, the priority is cars, the priority is matatus. For you as a pedestrian, you, you, you take your chances. You take your chances to cross the street, to walk. The streets are so full of people that you can just help jostling. And, and, and hitting each other. And, and of course, if you have a handbag, you clutch tightly to it because you don't know uh, who is timing you to, to, to just take off with it. Uh, one of the areas that I saw that they tried to do some the last time in Nairobi, uh, it's uh, somewhere not very far from Lutuli Avenue where they block the road uh, and cars cannot, it's a road, yes, but it's been blocked. Cars cannot use that road. So. People are free, and I felt so free. I mean, I, I just felt like, wow, wow, we should have more of this in Nairobi where there are no cars and people can just walk, people and I think a few bicycles. I don't know whether motorbikes manage to be, because once you escape the cars and there are the motorbikes right behind you. So so for me, I think that that was a plus. And if, if, if Badi has continued doing something uh, then that I think we are, we are moving in the right direction because that is where the world and is moving towards. Yeah, you want to you want to see less cars and you want to see more people. You want uh, wider pavements, walking pavements, and and narrower narrower vehicles actually. Yeah, and and that's why even when they try to implement uh, uh, some policies like raising the the parking fee and everybody goes up in arms, I still feel it should be implemented. People should, people should pay very expensively to park within because once you park within, that means you'll also be moving around within. Okay, so this one way of discouraging cars from coming, especially into the central business units, uh, leave them out. Let people be able to move from one place to the other. Let people be able to walk. Okay, let's reduce the pollution. Let's invest in public transportation. In this uh, city in Asia, sorry, in, in China, you see one of their major investments is in the, in the railway, very, very high speed railway. Okay, where you, you and, and, and most of the people, so in most of those neighborhoods, you can walk to, uh, to your workplace. You remember the circles they were showing? It shows that in this area, if you're living in this area, you can walk towards Maybe the metro, you can walk towards uh, the shopping mall, wherever you don't need you don't need a vehicle. Maybe you don't even need a bicycle for that matter. So uh, yeah, so I think uh, there are some efforts, but they're very slow. And the other question is, are the people buying in? Let's say like when you have to say no matatus in the CBD. Do, do the people understand why you're saying no matatus? It's not because the government does not want them to earn anything. It's just because if you continue this way, very uncontrolled, then we are going to be, we are not going to be a sustainable city. No, we are going to be a collapsing city. Yeah, sooner or later. So 
the seven principles that uh, we listened to in the TED talk and the new, uh, this video about China, I think those are very thought provoking and that is where I will base our cut one on. So I want you to, to go, I will send the questions for that one. I'll only give you a day to do the cut. Uh, so you tell me which is the best day. Do you want to do the cut on a Thursday? A Friday, you tell me it will only be one hour. You finish and you send me immediately. And I'll not give out the question until Thursday morning. So, what I want you to do in the meanwhile is to read. Read about sustainable cities, read about the, the principles of smart cities. And, and what is it that people are doing to, to make sure that cities return to, to, to who they are supposed to be? It's, it's, it's not just uh, developing housing units and putting them there and everybody living as an individual and, and you don't have any green space, you don't have a time to connect and everybody is it's in the hustle and bustle of life. It changes us from being the human beings we are to almost being robots. You see, wake up, do whatever you're doing in the house, go to work, come back and, and the cycle repeats. So, I'm going to send you the PowerPoint. I didn't finish off everything, but the last few bits that I didn't finish are on sustainable. Uh, they are on, on, on what's a, just the same thing, smart cities. So I'm going to send you that. You are going to, to read it. You're going to watch the videos again. And then you tell me through your class rep when you want the cut. I said the cut will only be one hour. I will tell you by the end of that one hour, you should all have sent the card to, to my email. If the card does not arrive by that time, then I consider it's not, it has not been done. So those of you who are using phones, I don't know what you're gonna do, get, your, get a laptop. Okay, so I think I want to stop there. And just tell the ones who disappeared from class, I have noted, I have noted, and that, that is not beneficial to them. It's, it's not me, it's, it's to them. It's just not beneficial, but anyway, they, they are grown up, I can't help that. So, so let's meet again on Wednesday, God willing, at eight o'clock. No, 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 today afternoon, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I was already on Wednesday. Let's meet at, at one o'clock for S, uh, SMR 409. See you later.